All right, so now, now we're recording and we'll get into the important stuff. So the presentation tonight will go a little bit, uh, we'll go over a bit on uh, nature observations and then we'll talk about what iNaturalist is. Um, how to use iNaturalist, which will include uh, creating an account, uh, finding wildlife, documenting and photographing wildlife, and sharing your observations to iNaturalist. Um, we'll touch on uh, exploring iNaturalist on the website and the information that you can get, um, and then some upcoming events um, that in Kentucky that are uh, utilizing iNaturalist that you can participate in. So we're gonna start out with this quote here from Mary Oliver. So this is an excerpt from one of her poems. Um, but uh, when I uh, read this recently, it really kind of uh, resonated with me on how I um, sort of feel about nature and um, often sort of approach um, my uh, relationship to it. So instructions for living a life, pay attention, be astonished and tell about it. You know, so a lot of times, you know, I work at Flora Cliff, it's an amazing place. Um, and most of these photographs here come from Flora Cliff. And often, you know, when I see some of these things, I'm just going, wow, that's amazing. Or that's very strange. Um, what is it? Or maybe somebody else is interested in this. Um, and it often starts a conversation. Um, and, you know, in kind of doing that, that's, I would say, is mainly um, a big part of what is the precursor to iNaturalist is just making observations like this, um, paying attention to the world around you, um, and uh, just being curious and, um, and then sharing that with other people. And so it could be, you know, different things, you know, like this morning cloak butterfly, you know, I observed that in the middle of summer and they're typically an early spring butterfly. Um, you know, there is this little strange little egg raft that was on one of our ponds. So that's like a non-biting uh, midge fly. Um, there's also, you know, a pollinator that uh, was found on one of our rare plants that we thought, you know, some people might be interested in. Uh, so these are all just, you know, if you start looking and start digging around, you can see some really cool things out there, even if you're in uh, an urban county. So how we often tell about it is through social media, so like Facebook or Instagram, um, or you might tell your friends, family, and colleagues um, either in person via text message or email. But what if you could also share your nature observations in a way that tells you more about what you are seeing? contributes information about species occurrences and ranges, provides biologists information about species they're studying, connects you to other nature enthusiasts near and far, and organizes your observations on a map and a life list. So this is where iNaturalist comes in. Um, so iNaturalist calls itself a community for naturalists. So this includes both professional and amateur naturalists. You don't have to be an expert, anyone can participate. Um, but it's basically an online social network of people sharing biodiversity information to help each other learn about nature. Um, and iNaturalist will say that their primary goal is to connect people to nature. Um, all the data that comes from iNaturalist is just a byproduct of those connections. Um, it is run through the California Academy of Sciences and National Geographic, but it originally started as uh, in 2008 as someone's uh, master's project. Uh, and since then, it's grown to over 91 million observations, over 344 species documented, 344,000 species documented, um, 235,000 spe people identifying um, nature and observations on iNaturalist, and then over 2 million um, observers participating. So what else is iNaturalist? It is an app uh, through either Apple or Android devices. Uh, it's also a website and these um, both applications kind of have their pros and cons. So we'll kind of go over that a little bit tonight. Uh, I tend to use the app for submitting observations and then I use the website for um, exploring the data. It's also a tool for species identification. So there is um, a sort of photo recognition system that's um, built into iNaturalist and sometimes it works really well and sometimes it doesn't. But beyond that, um, it's also a network of course of, iNat of other naturalists. So um, you, they are also um, that part of that tool for species identification. It's a map and a database of the world's biodiversity. It's an open source resource. Um, so data from iNaturalist has been useful for tracking invasive species, discovering new species, uh, rediscovery of rare and presumed extinct species, 
Um, and then in uh, 2021 in Kentucky alone, um, the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves was able to get uh, new records on over 140 um, of their rare species that they're monitoring just from iNaturalist. Um, it's also useful for understanding regional variations in species. Uh, there is um, a research project that's often referenced on uh, dragonflies, where it was often thought that this particular species had a different color of wing pattern in the Western US than in the Eastern US, um, but there wasn't very good documentation on that. And they naturalist records and were able to confirm that and then see how uh, the temperature in those areas, how that related to um, the wing coloration on those dragonflies. It can be useful for documenting phenology. So if you don't know what phenology is, that's just the timing of um, biological events. So when a flower blooms or when a butterfly um, starts you know, emerging, uh, things like that, when birds start calling. Uh, it's also a personal journal of the wildlife that you've encountered. So iNaturalist creates a life list. So we'll go over that a little bit later. Um, but what iNaturalist is not, um, is it's not a good data source for determining population size and trends in species. And so when you're submitting observations to iNaturalist, it's not, um, you're not saying I saw, you know, 10 robins, you're only submitting an, an observation of one robin. And there's also, you know, with the observations that people submit to iNaturalist, there can be a bit of a, a bias of maybe it's the more charismatic species or the species that they're most interested in and not necessarily um, every species that they're encountering. So if you um, don't already have um, an iNaturalist um, account, that would be the first step in getting into this. Um, so, you know, you'll set up uh, an account through your email and you'll have a username. Your username does not have to um, be anything close to your real name. It can be anything that you want. Um, they do, you'll see this first checkbox is about licensing your photos and sounds and observations so that scientists can use the data. And so that basically would make your photos um, available through a non-commercial license. Um, and that's recommended so that if your, your observations become research grade, that your observations and in, in the photos that accompany those observations will then be made available to the um, GBIF database, which is the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. Um, it also makes it available for scientists who um, might want to use your images in a research paper that they can do so. Uh, and then once you set up your account, um, this you'll have a profile page. So this is mine here, and there'll be different tabs at the top of your profile page. Um, so you can uh, navigate to your observations. Uh, you can navigate to your life list. Um, if there are other people's observations that you kind of want to save, um, then you can put those under favorites and find them more easily. Um, and then you can also see the, your, your observations. Um, the species that you've encountered and anything that you have submitted identifications on. So the next step in using iNaturalist is basically to go out and find wildlife and make those um, discoveries. So one thing that iNaturalist is very specific about is, um, is notating um, that whether something is going to be wild that you're being a good data steward by marking it as such. Um, so we'll go over the differences here. So wild species includes um, insects that may be on plants or other features in yards, parks, etc. So it could be a butterfly or bee that's um, pollinating a flower, a praying mantis. Um, and you know, this is a mason bee that was um, in my backyard. Um, so any, uh, most insects that you're going to encounter um, should be wild, if not all of them. Um, any birds that you see at feeders or flying overhead or in trees um, are likely going to be wild. Um, exceptions would be, you know, backyard chickens. Um, if somebody's pet bird escaped, that would be um, not a wild bird. Uh, lichens, mosses, or fungi uh, would be considered wild species. Uh, and then self-seeded plants and yards and parks. Uh, would also be considered wild. Uh, so this is a Ruellia species that popped up in my backyard. My yard goes all the way to a, a creek in the back. So there's a section that I don't mow and that just popped up on its own. So that would be considered a wild because I did not plant it. 
So looking at captive and cultivated species, um, that would include um, pets, livestock, um, and zoo animals. I think one exception here would probably be um, cats, you know, feral cat colonies uh, would be considered wild. Um, and if it's like a, a house cat that somebody has, um, you know, let out of their house, then that could potentially be debatable. So I would say just use your own judgment on that. Um, planted trees, wildflowers, and other plants um, are considered um, captive and cultivated. Um, house plants as well. And then if cultivated mushrooms, if you have shiitake logs, um, that would also be considered cultivated. So some backyard examples here. So we have the bladder nut, the black chokeberry, and the flowering dogwood. These are all woody plants that I planted in my backyard. So they would be considered cultivated if I put them on iNaturalist. Um, but the flies and the bees that are attracted to those plants are all considered wild. Um, another example here, the purple phacelia. I have this in my backyard, um, but I know that it, it is a biennial plant. So it's on a two year life cycle. So after two years, um, it is a self-seeding um, population of purple phacelia. Uh, so at that point, um, it is considered wild. So I would submit that observation as wild. And then the bumblebee that's on it is also wild. So moving on into um, activities that you can do to um, find wildlife, either in urban areas or, um, or other parts um, and rural areas elsewhere, um, you can uh, look at you know, garden plants or other plantings um, for uh, wildlife. And we're using wildlife as a very broad term for this presentation, Some people just animals, but we are using it to include um, plants, animals, fungi, or other insects like katydids that um, are leaf eaters. Um, so you might see those as well. Um, but if you look closely at a lot of uh, planted areas, um, you can start finding some wildlife. Some other activities you can do would be to set up a bird feeding station. So bird watching um, increased uh, during the pandemic um, for a good reason, because people wanted to um, interact with nature and experience it. And this was an easy way to do that while they were um, sitting at home. Um, if you do have a bird feeding station, uh, we do recommend a variety of different feeders, tube feeders, platform feeders, and suet feeders that can accommodate small birds and larger birds, um, but also a variety of um, different um, foods, including seeds, nuts, uh, fruits, and protein, as well as a water source, if you can um, accommodate that. Uh, moth lights are a good way to uh, learn more about um, night um, insects. So, uh, you know, this is our fancy system at Flora Cliff, um, but you can also do it with just a white bed sheet. Uh, it's usually recommended to, um, that the sheet have um, more natural fibers, um, a UV light, uh, which can be just a black light party light if you don't want to get the more expensive system. Um, and then a source of a, a electricity, so either a battery or an extension cord to power that light. Um, you could leave on your porch light, um, but we do recommend only doing that temporarily and not indefinitely. And that's really with any artificial lighting um, that you just do it long enough to um, you know, make some observations, um, but they can um, disorient wildlife. So uh, we recommend that you not leave them on um, all the time. Cover boards are a good way to find different things. So we utilize uh, these um, old roofing tent at Flora Cliff and uh, we often find snakes, uh, sometimes toads and occasionally turtles under those. Uh, I know some of you may be more excited about finding snakes than others. Um, so, um, you know, this may not be an activity for everybody. And of course, if you're in a more urban area, um, you may not see as many of these things. You might get garter snakes um, and some insects under um, some beetles and other things under cover boards, but it is something that you can do to um, look for wildlife. Um, natural shelters are also really great. Uh, so rocks um, in and along streams or garden borders. Um, yeah, I use rocks and logs um, along some of my garden borders in the backyard, and it's a good place to find spiders and ants and other things, um, you know, if I'm trying to document things for the City Nature Challenge. 
Um, loose bark um, is another thing. Uh, these urban creeks that we have around here, you can uh, look along under the rocks along the, the stream edge and maybe find um, salamanders or crawdads in some areas. Uh, you can also look for signs of species. Um, so if you're, these all count for iNaturalist observations. Uh, so it could be a cocoon or a chrysalis. Um, a lot of times those can be identified. Uh, it could be a gall uh, or a snail shell that is empty. Um, if you are photographing a snail, you do want to get a few different angles. Uh, so you want to get the opening. Um, and then depending on the shape, you might want to get the top um, and the bottom part of the, the shell as well. Um, bones and scat also count as well as uh, feathers. And then a few other things that we utilize at Flora Cliff um, to find and document wildlife. Um, we have a few ponds where we set up minnow traps uh, where we can uh, document frogs and salamanders. Uh, sweep nets, uh, you can you know, just kind of run those across a field uh, to find different insects. Motion activated cameras, it doesn't have to be um, a trail camera. It could be a lot of people have motion activated cameras on their house now. So, um, you know, if you have a, a raccoon or a possum or a bird that shows up, you can put those pictures on iNaturalist too. Um, and then you can create a butterfly uh, bait or puddling station. Uh, some people use like a mix of uh, rotting fruit um, and beer uh, to attract butterflies. Um, I haven't quite found an ideal recipe for that, but there are a lot of um, suggestions out there on the internet. And then the slide that maybe some of you don't want to see is you can look inside your home for wildlife. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is kind of an interesting graphic here, but you might see things in your home and wonder, what is that? Uh, well, you can take a picture of it and you can put it on iNaturalist and somebody um, could help you with that. So the next step um, with using iNaturalist would be to document your findings uh, with a photograph or an audio recording. So the audio recording is a more recent feature of iNaturalist, I think just in the last couple of years. Um, so I won't be talking about it as much tonight, but it is um, something that you can do. Um, and so you can take pictures with, uh, of course, smartphones, uh, which is typically what I do because that's the camera that I always have on me, um, but um, other cameras work too. Um, and you can, if you open up the um, iNaturalist app, um, and I will say I, for submitting observations to iNaturalist, I primarily uh, use the app over the website um, just because it's, I find it to be um, a little easier and, you know, I have, always have um, my phone on me over the computer. Um, but if you, so that's, I'm going to primarily cover the app for submitting um, an observation. Um, and you can do that from this observe button, and then you can open up the camera directly from the app um, if you want to. Um, what I tend to do is to just use the photo app that's already on my phone, and I just concentrate on taking pictures when I'm out in the field. I don't really concentrate on the iNaturalist app itself. I just want to go out and look at things and, and just get photographs of them and, and get make sure I get you know decent photographs. Um, and then I upload the photographs later when I'm at home or I'm you know just got like a pause and um, my field outing or, or whatever. That's when I'll um, upload them to photo to iNaturalist. But there are some different options here. So you can do it directly through the app or you can open your photo library. Um, and this is where you could also submit an, uh, an audio recording. Um, if you do submit an audio recording, that does go directly through the app. Um, you can record and then you can listen to the recording. And if it's not good enough, then you can trash it and then and create another recording. And if you, um, you can also use, um, like I said, a, you know, a real camera, and then you can transfer those pictures to your phone or your computer later um, and document them on iNaturalist that way. Some photo tips um, for iNaturalist. Um, you know, I do rec uh, recommend um, functional photos over artistic photos. Um, photographs can be both, um, but if it can only be one um, for iNaturalist, then I recommend um, going for functional. I uh, do recommend focusing on one species at a time. Um, sometimes that's easier said than done because if it's a pollinator that's on a flower, you're obviously gonna have two species in that picture and that's okay. But if you have like a picture that's five or six plants and none of those plants are really like fully highlighted, um, that can be a little confusing to the people who are trying to um, identify uh, what you have in your picture. 
Uh, you also want to take photos of multiple features and angles if possible. So with this spring salamander, I got a picture of the top um, because the um, spotting pattern is going to be important for identification. But I also know that some of these markings on its face um, are important as well. So, you know, we use these containers here so that we're not um, handling the salamanders uh, while we're trying to photograph them. Um, and that can be really helpful. Uh, you can use your hand to focus on smaller objects. So that's what you see here on the right. Um, sometimes, especially if um, for objects that are very thin, it can be difficult for our phone cameras to focus on that. But you can use something in the background, either your hand or a notebook to help with that focus. And you can even then do a focus lock on your phone uh, to um, make sure you're um, getting the object um, properly focused. Macro photos can help for really small species or small details. Uh, it's recommended to crop photos uh, as much as possible. And then with time, uh, you'll notice that there are going to be some images are, are useful for identification and then maybe some of your images that aren't useful for identification. And so it's just a learning process. And over time, you'll make better observations the more you do it. Some other photo tips. Um, so it, like with bees and probably other insects, it's recommended to get the side view, the back view, um, and the face. Um, but if something is, you know, like with this bee is just constantly moving around, uh, that's not always possible. So you really you know, just do the best you can. If you can't get the perfect photos, like all of these are just a little bit blurry, but I, you know, it was a bee that I was not used to seeing and I really wanted to get it on iNaturalist, but these photos were still good enough for the experts out there to identify it as an American bumblebee. And so I was still able to learn something from that, even though it's not the perfect photo. So don't get too focused on that. Uh, with plants, you do want to try to capture as many different features of the plant as possible. So uh, while the flowers might be the most photogenic thing, um, make sure you're looking at all the leaves. Some of the leaves might be all the way down on the ground. Uh, so uh, just get those two. Sometimes it's good to get the entire plant or get some scale in there so that people um, understand how large of a plant it might be that you're um, asking for an identification on. Uh, then the next step will be to share your observations on iNaturalist. So we'll go over how to turn your photographs into um, this type of observation. And this is going to be a video that plays and hopefully it will go okay for you. Okay, so you've installed the iNaturalist app and created an account. Time to get outside and record your first observation. Here's how to do it. Any living thing, like a plant, animal, or fungus can be an observation on iNaturalist. Once you find something you'd like to record, just tap Observe and take a photo. You can review your picture, then hit Next if it looks good. To identify it, hit what did you see? If you have an internet connection, iNaturalist will suggest 10 visually similar species and often a common ancestor. You can choose one of those or search for a species name. On this observation details screen, you can add more photos of the same organism or write a note. The date, time, and location have been automatically added. You can also change the geo-privacy of the observation, mark whether it's captured or cultivated, or add it to a project. Once you're finished, just hit share and your observation will be uploaded for everyone to see and identify. That's it. Keep on exploring and sharing. to the next slide here. So now we'll go through those steps um, just a little bit slower. So on the left, we have uh, the iPhone app. And on the right, we have what you would see if you have an Android. Um, so it's pretty much you know, the same steps, but they just look a little bit different. 
Um, so again, the first step is going to be to get your pictures in there, um, possibly multiple pictures. I went on the iPhone. I know what I'm selecting the pictures to make an observation. It usually limits me at four pictures, but once I'm on this screen, I can hit that plus sign um, and add more than four pictures um, if it's necessary. It's usually not, but every now and then it is. And then you see this, uh, what did you see? Um, and it says um, to view suggestions. So iNaturalist does have a photo recognition tool um, that's not always perfect. And I think it's the next slide where we'll kind of go over um, some examples of, of when it works and when it doesn't. Um, but the most important thing here is to, uh, whatever um, identification you put with your observation, that you should be identifying to the level that you are confident. Um, so um, a couple of slides ago, there was, um, you know, I had a pollinator that was on a spring beauty flower. So when I submitted it, um, I could, it looked kind of like a bee, but it didn't look furry enough to be a bee. And so I put it in a group that was like the bees and wasp, um, cause that's what I felt, you know, the best about. And then somebody came in later and identified it as, um, a nomad bee. Um, but, um, I'm not necessarily going to agree that it's a nomad bee, um, because that's, that's just an area that is kind of beyond my expertise level. So, um, just go with what you are most confident with there. Um, if, if plant is the best you can do, that's the best you can do, and that is okay. Um, the main thing is that we suggest that you don't leave it as unknown um, because it can get sort of lost in the um, um, sort of iNaturalist world and, and it won't get that much attention. So if you can at least put plant or bird or fungus, uh, then that can help um, experts in those areas uh, see your observation. Uh, in adding notes, uh, so if say it's a caterpillar that is on um, a maple tree, um, if you could at least maybe add that it's on uh, maybe a sugar maple, then that can help people who uh, know caterpillars and know host plants um, to help identify uh, what caterpillar you might have seen. Or if it's a plant that is in um, a drier habitat versus like a floodplain, uh, that can also be useful. Uh, you want to make sure that the date um, is correct and you know a lot of times on the phone that's already going to be entered um, but if you don't have that information uh, with your photograph then you need to enter that yourself and it may be that the default date is going to be today um, but you took that picture two weeks ago uh, you just need to make sure that um, you're entering the correct date for the observation uh, and then with the location, so on your phone, if you have location services on, um, this is gonna be really easy. Um, so I tend to leave my location services on for um, iNaturalist uh, because to not do that makes this observation process just a little bit more tedious because you would have to click on a map and then zoom in um, kind of to your exact location. Um, and you'll see here on this, it's showing an accuracy of 55 meters. Um, so I think that's kind of default for um, my phone. Um, you can potentially zoom in and make that um, even smaller if you want, um, but mainly you just want to make sure that the location is correct. Uh, geo privacy, so you're going to have three options under that. You, you have open, uh, which is going to show everybody uh, where the location of your observation is located. Uh, if it is maybe at your house, or if it's a sensitive species, or uh, like a rare plant, or if it's a poachable plant, um, then you may want to um, put obscured. And what that would do is basically it makes the location inside of a uh, 500 square kilometer box. Um, so it at least tells other people looking at your observation that they saw this kind of somewhere in central Kentucky, but it doesn't give the exact location um, to, um, to folks that, that we don't want that information to go to. Um, and then there's private. It's recommended to not use private because if you use private, there are you know, people who are trying to identify um, your, your observation won't have any location information at all. So you could see you could have seen it in Kentucky or you could have seen it in California. Um, and if they don't have enough to go by on the photos, it's just going to be really difficult to identify. Um, so if you uh, want to sort of protect the location a little bit, obscured should be enough. Um, if it is a rare or sensitive or vulnerable species, iNaturalist does automatically obscure uh, those observations. Um, so uh, you can be comforted by that. I know every like box turtle that I add on iNaturalist, it automatically um, gets obscured. 
And then again, that captive cultivated thing. So on um, the Apple iPhone, uh, you'll have to click on that and then um, enter a yes or no for, actually, well, the default is gonna be no, but if it is captive or cultivated, you'll have to go in and change that to yes. Um, on the Android, it looks like there's a checkbox. Um, so that might be just a little bit faster on that end. So here's where we uh, kind of examine the what did you see feature. Um, so this is an example here of um, shooting star that I took a picture of. So iNaturalist is saying, we're pretty sure that this is in um, you know, the, the right genus. Um, and so they're right there. And their, their top suggestions are gonna be Eastern shooting star, uh, white fawn lily, which would be wrong. And then poets narcissus, which would be wrong. But their top suggestion there is right. So that it worked out pretty well for that example. Uh, next, we have this moth here, um, and they're pretty sure that it's in this genus, and they are correct about that. Um, but one thing that I know about um, these two moths here, the banded tussock moth and the sycamore tussock moth, is that as adults, you have to um, look at those under a microscope to uh, really tell the difference between the two. Um, so you cannot uh, differentiate them by a photograph. So this is where you don't necessarily wanna go uh, with that top suggestion because you really can't determine that from a photograph. Um, our next example here is, uh, so this is a, uh, it's hard to see, but it's um, just a twig of an American elm. So the buds were bursting recently. So we wanted to document that and we took a picture of it. Um, so they weren't confident enough to put it into any specific group. Um, and their top suggestion is slippery elm, which is a close relative, but American elm is the third one down. So, you know, they got close, but again, not perfect. And then the last example here, so this is, um, a fairly uh, rare plant at Flora Cliff. It's called Woods Bunch Flower. Um, you know, as a rare plant, it probably doesn't have that many images on iNaturalist for a comparison. Um, so they're already saying they're not confident enough to make a recommendation. And then the two suggestions they give are um, not correct at all. So it does help if you know like a little bit about what you're taking a picture of, but don't always go with the top suggestions. If you're not feeling very confident, then you can, um, you know, again, just use plant or, you know, Lepidoptera or elm um, and so forth. All right, and if you uh, want to add observations using the computer uh, rather than uh, the a smartphone device or a tablet, uh, you can do so. Uh, this is where you would go on your home page. Um, so to add observations, and then you would go through the same steps that we just followed and it would walk you through all of that. Um, and just so that you all know, iNaturalist does have these tutorial videos. So like the one um, that I just played um, for a mobile device, they have one for making an observation on the web, taking photos, how to use the identify page um, so that you can watch those videos over and over as much as necessary um, to um, get those steps right. And I don't want to overwhelm you with too many different steps during the presentation. Um, some other things to um, keep in mind is once you make an observation, um, on, there are different levels of observations. So if you look at the bottom of this one, you'll see casual grade, needs ID, and research grade. So only needs ID and research grade qualify as what iNaturalist calls verifiable observations. And so as a verifiable observation, that means that those observations have a date, um, they're geo-referenced, so they have a location, um, they have photos or sounds uh, so that people can identify them, um, and they're not captive or cultivated organisms. Um, they can become research grade when more than two thirds of identifiers agree um, on a taxon, so a species level ID or lower. And then once they become research grade observations, they're published to the GBIF database. Um, and it can be possible for research grade observations to get downgraded to needs ID again. So with this white M hair streak, if somebody came in and said, I don't think that's a white M hair streak, I think that's a gray hair streak, then, um, then it would get downgraded to needs ID until a fourth person came in and said, no, no, it's a white M hair streak. So that can kind of go back and forth sometimes. Uh, with casual observations, uh, so those observations will be designated as casual and unverifiable if one or more of the following apply. It doesn't have a date or the date's incorrect. Uh, it doesn't have a location or it has an incorrect location. 
Um, and people can kind of look at your observations and if they think that the date or the location is incorrect, then um, there are people in the iNaturalist community that can mark it as such and that would cause it to be a casual observation. If it doesn't have a photo or an audio recording or if it's designated as captive or cultivated. So this is a sassafras tree um, in my yard. Um, I planted it, so I marked it as um, cultivated. And for that reason, um, it's a casual observation. I still felt like it was useful to add to um, iNaturalist for the phenology records because it was fruiting at the time. Um, but um, as a casual observation, it doesn't get as much attention from the iNaturalist community. So nobody has come in to confirm identification um, on this uh, sassafras observation. So it's just something to keep in mind. And this is something that is highly debated in the iNaturalist community, especially with cultivated plants, um, that maybe there should be a third designation um, that uh, is somewhere between um, the casual and the, uh, the verifiable, because they definitely are an important part of our urban landscape and ecology. So the next step for uh, using iNaturalist would be to learn from the iNaturalist community. Uh, so this is a fly that was in my backyard um, about a year ago or so, and I recognized it as being some type of hoverfly, but I didn't know what. Um, so most people, when they identify things on iNaturalist, they usually just um, you know put an identification on there, but every now and then somebody will add a comment and I'll get really excited about those comments because a lot of times they're very helpful. So Trina Roberts, who often comments on um, this particular group, um, identified it and provided a link um, to do some more investigation. And so there's another resource that um, I can dig into to learn more about this group. Um, and then this observation was made by one of our volunteers and it was originally identified as smooth Solomon seal. And I think it had even been research grade as smooth Solomon seal. And then somebody came in and disagreed and said it was Harry Solomon seal. They didn't provide a comment. So Josie um, tagged them and asked for more information. And luckily they provided it and provided information about the leaves and the flowers and the habitat differentiation between Harry Solomon seal and smooth Solomon seal. And then one of the botanists at the office of Kentucky Nature Preserves even chimed in and was like very you know, grateful for the additional information. Um, so you can get some really interesting discussions on iNaturalist um, and learn a lot from the community um, the more you use it. And then at Flora Cliff, we've been making a concerted effort to uh, document um, pollinators. And um, so, you know, especially like bees and flies that are um, attracted to our spring ephemerals that are using our pollinator field by the Nature Center. Um, we've also been working on um, butterfly and um, you know moth documentation out there, um, but pretty much you know all the bumblebee records that we have at Flora Cliff are pretty much on iNaturalist. Um, and then so we have five species that we know about: uh, the two-spotted bumblebee and the black and gold bumblebee were just added um, to our species list last year. Um, so we're gonna you know we're gonna continue this effort uh, this year and as long as we need to, but we're hoping to um, expand that list. So some ways that you can explore um, iNaturalist observations, um, and this is where I use um, the website um, to kind of dig into the data of iNaturalist. Um, so this is sort of a partial screenshot here. And at the top of the iNaturalist website, you'll see a search bar. You'll also see explore. So you can kind of navigate through um, exploring the data through either of those. And for this particular page, what I did was I just entered butterflies in the search bar. Um, and then once I came to this page, I entered Kentucky and the location. Um, and then what comes up is, you know, I can navigate through over 11,000 observations of butterflies in Kentucky. You could go to the species tab and see how many observations of each um, species are documented in Kentucky. So it'll start with the most common to the uh, least common um, and so forth. So you can do that with really any uh, species group that you might be interested in and tailor it to a location. You can also look at the map view of different uh, groups or specific species. So here I'm looking at the great purple hair streak and the range map. Um, and you can see that Kentucky is just at the northern end of its range. It's a pretty rare butterfly um, in Kentucky. Um, but if you wanna know more about you know, where species are located, uh, you can use that map function for that. Uh, you can also look at, um, so looking at that species tab here on a given location, we're looking at Fayette County. Um, and these are the species that are, you know, most documented um, in Fayette County. 
Um, and you see things that are, you know, range from charismatic species like the monarch butterfly um, and, you know, the spring beauties that put on a good show in the springtime and the bumblebees to uh, really common backyard birds like the robin and the cardinal um, to, and the squirrel there um, to um, our problematic invasives like amber honeysuckle um, and winter creeper. And if you kept scrolling, you would see, um, you know, a lot more species that people are observing. Um, if you're a, a teacher, um, this could be a, a useful feature of iNaturalist. So if you're not quite ready to go out and uh, make observations with your students um, in the field or the schoolyard, you can explore some of this data and maybe create, um, you know, student projects around, um, you know, some of the species that are common um, to their area. So at Flora Cliff, we have created the Flora Cliff Biodiversity Project. So I think this was created in 2014 or 15 um, as a um, summer intern project, and it's just grown since then. Uh, so it's been really great for us. Um, so between us and our, our staff and volunteers and visitors, we have over 6,000 observations at Flora Cliff um, that are representing um, over 1,500 species. So this has been a really great way for us to um, know more about um, the biodiversity um, at Flora Cliff and also may, make it a little more dynamic and engaging um, for other people. So on a personal level, so this is um, my life list um, on iNaturalist. Um, so I've been using iNaturalist since uh, 2014 or so. Um, and so you can go to the tree view and I have over 1800 observations on iNaturalist. Uh, about half of those are arthropods um, because insects are a group that I'm really interested in documenting and learning more about. Um, but you can kind of navigate and see you know, how um, the observations you've made, how they're uh, related to, um, you know, other groups uh, and so forth. And you can click on any of these little levels and see um, your observations in them. So it's really kind of fun to do that. You can also go to a map view of your observations and revisit some, you know, vacations you've had, or you can also, you know, explore those maps and see other people's observations and um, be inspired for uh, future vacations and so forth. And so again, for educators, um, iNaturalist does have um, a teacher's guide. So if you go under the more tab, you can navigate to the teacher's guide. Um, and there's a lot more information than what you see here. This is just what would fit in the screen grab. Um, but some of their um, recommendations include, uh, you know, getting to know iNaturalist first, you know, make about 30 observations to get comfortable with it. Um, don't set large goals for your class. Um, you'll have to manage copyright issues, especially if you're managing um, a classroom account, just making sure they're not taking pictures of pictures in a book. Um, and then you also need to curate that account. Um, and then if you're working with students that are under 13, um, so that is the, um, the minimum age for iNaturalist, it's recommended to use uh, their uh, sister app uh, called uh, Seek, uh, which uh, does not have the um, location, but you can go out and at least um, explore nature and it has an identification feature on Seek that you can use and you can earn badges and so forth. Um, but there are a lot of you know, lesson plans around iNaturalist and um, you know, making these observations if that's something that you're interested in. So moving forward to some upcoming events. Uh, so Flora Cliff and the um, North American Butterfly Association, uh, Central Kentucky Chapter and Lexington Parks and Rec are hosting uh, the City Nature Challenge for Lexington. Uh, it's also happening in uh, Jefferson County in Louisville this year, uh, as well as Madison County. So if you're in uh, Berea or uh, Richmond, uh, you can participate. Uh, so the City Nature Challenge started in 2016 as a competition between San Francisco and Los Angeles, uh, and it has grown significantly since then. So last year was the first year that we participated, and there were over 400 cities uh, in 44 countries um, participating, um, over 1 million observations were made over that four day period. Um, but it's essentially it's a four day bio blitz to get people out and noticing nature uh, where they live. And so here are results from last year. So we had over 700 species documented in Fayette County, uh, which were mainly represented by plants, insects, and birds, but there are a number of other things there as well. And out of the 419 cities, Lexington finished in the top 30% for the number of observations, the top 25% for the number of species, and the top 20% for the number of observers on iNaturalist. Um, so there we are. Um, there's definitely a lot of cities that, of course, came above us, um, but you can see kind of where we fell um, with some other cities. Uh, we did beat um, 
Knoxville area. So uh, just kind of nice to see where we fall within some regional competition. Um, and then again, so we're this year we're um, going to be competing uh, with Madison County and Jefferson County. Um, and then some other dates associated or uh, with the City Nature Challenge. So after, oops, that should say um, to May 2nd rather than May 3rd. I'm um, still kind of stuck on last year's dates a little bit. Um, it's actually April 29th to May 2nd uh, is when you go out and document. Um, and then from May 3rd to May 8th, um, you have some extra time to submit your observations to iNaturalist. Um, and then also people from the iNaturalist community will have that time to identify your observations. And then May 9th um, is when the results um, will be announced by the official City Nature Challenge organizers. Another event coming up is the Kentucky Native Plant Society uh, Wildflower Week Botany Blitz. Um, so this is a project on um, iNaturalist. So you can, in that search bar uh, that we highlighted a little bit ago at the top of the iNaturalist website, you can search for KNPS Wildflower Week 2022 Botany Blitz to find this project. Um, and you can join it. So for this particular uh, week-long um, botany blitz, this one is for project members only. Um, so to um, compete in that, you just have to join the project. But with this one, they're just trying to get people all over Kentucky to uh, document wildflowers and other um, plants that are out and about um, in that first week of April. And to um, prepare for that, they are having a number of iNaturalist tutorial hikes throughout Kentucky. Um, so we will be at Raven Run uh, with um, Anna, the naturalist there on Friday, April 1st from three to 5.30. Um, if you're interested in um, joining us for that, um, you do need to email Anna and all the details will be at that QR code. It's also on our website. Um, but if you're in the Louisville area, there's going to be one at the Louisville Nature Center on April 2nd. If you're in Madison County, uh, Taylor Fork is gonna have one. Um, but I know my learning style is um, to you know, learn by doing um, and then you know, doing it again and again. Um, and so this is, you know, will give you a good opportunity to get that hands-on experience, to ask people who have experience with iNaturalist um, and just sort of practice in the field um, if you do wanna um, participate in the Botany Blitz or the um, City Nature Challenge. Um, and then if you are just looking for some ideas on places to observe nature in urban areas, um, there could be native plant gardens or tree plantings around town. So, you know, in this picture we have, this is a wild ones uh, garden, native plant garden out at Wellington Park, and that's a reforest and bluegrass site in the background. You know, those are excellent places to go look for nature. Um, when other city parks, neighborhood green spaces, cemeteries, arboretums, schoolyards, uh, water sources, whether it's the Kentucky River or the Ohio River um, and the creeks that um, feed into those. Um, the reservoirs here in town in Lexington can be great for birds. And then of course, um, our natural areas. And if you have some farmland, um, that can also be really great um, as well. Some observation ethics just to keep, on my, keep in mind as you do this. Um, if you are at parks or natural areas, just um, stay on trails and pathways as designated um, by those places. Um, should take only pictures and uh, we don't want you destroying um, species that you're observing in the process. Uh, just remember to obscure the location of any sensitive or poachable species. Um, and then of course, respect wildlife. So if it's at night, um, avoiding flash photography, um, we recommend, and then also to handle animals as little as necessary or not at all. Um, so if we're working with amphibians or aquatic species, we often use containers um, so that people um, can view those so that we're not, um, the oils and things on our hands aren't impacting them, but we also don't wanna stress the animals out too much. Those are just some things to keep in mind. Um, so to recap, uh, why we should use iNaturalist um, to connect to nature through exploration, to learn about nature near a home, to connect with other people in your community while looking for nature, uh, to connect with people in the iNaturalist community who can help you identify nature, to contribute to information about biodiversity because looking, because nature is good for your health and because looking for nature is fun. Um, you know, I do realize 
in you know, the few years that I've been um, using iNaturalist and also teaching iNaturalist um, that it's not for everybody. Sometimes, you know, some people don't like apps and tech and, um, and that's okay. Um, that um, in using iNaturalist, it can be a group activity. So, and we definitely encourage that, that you kind of go out and with other people and look for these things together. Um, and then, you know, maybe there's that person in your group that um, enjoys being the note taker, enjoys using the gadgets um, that, um, that really just need one person that's into this. Um, not everybody has to be, so it's okay. Um, and then just to end here, so these pictures are from um, some places in Lexington. So when the pandemic got started in um, spring of 2020, we asked some of our volunteers to send us um, pictures of nature that they were seeing near their homes. Um, and this is a sampling of what we got um, from them. So um, just to show you that it, once you start looking, you can see a lot even in our urban areas. So with that, I will take any questions that you all have. So Beverly, I just put the um, our link from FloraCliff into the chat for the Raven Run event. Um, yes. Somebody noticed, let's see, um, that it wasn't showing up at Raven Run on, on the LFUCG website. And that's because oh. um, people need to actually give Anna a call at Raven Run. Yeah. And I think, I think it's email over a phone call. Oh, thank you, an email. And then the other thing I was gonna say is um, Margaret's made a few comments tonight and they've been helpful. Mm -hmm. So maybe, maybe Margaret, you'd like to jump on here and say hi. Carrera. Yeah, okay, <laughs> hi. Uh, okay, I'll start me up again. Hi there. I think I'm coming on anyway, yep. if not. Um, yeah, I'm Margaret Carrero and uh, I will be the uh, administrator for the Jefferson County City Nature Challenge. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, that. I see that several people I contacted today are here learning more about iNaturalist. And Beverly, I have to say, you did such a thorough job. You. It's like I, I asked a question and then like about two minutes later, you <laughs> answered it. Um, but one of the things um, I wanted to say was, uh, well, you recorded this session, mm -hmm. I yes. believe. And uh, anyway, will you provide us with the link to that? Because I know some folks who could not make it tonight, but would yes. really appreciate being able to view it. Yes, so well, how, definitely. How will, you, how will you send us the link? So it's being recorded to the Zoom cloud at the moment. And once they give us the link, um, then Josie will send out um, an email to everyone that's registered and you can share it um, with other people that way. Um, so we, you should have it by the end of the week. Sometimes we need a, a day or two to get that going. Yeah, th that'll be great. Thank you. Um, I don't think I, I asked some questions, but like I said, I believe all of them you um, dealt with. You did a, just a great job, even like, you know, how do you add? One of the things I see on iNaturalist a lot is when people take several photos of a single specimen, they put it up as a separate, mm. um, you know, observation because they don't know how to add photos to a single observation. And yep. you did that great. And also the fact that say to identify a plant, it would be helpful if you had the whole plant if possible, if it's not too big um, and things like the leaves, how, you know, the leaf, how the leaves come off of the stems, um, any flowers or fruits that they have, all of those in one observation are very helpful to identifying a plant. Cause sometimes, you know, people just have this like weird out of focus <laughs> photo of a plant, you know, and it's like, I don't know, sometimes you can tell as an expert, but. But uh, most of the time, it's like, well, beats me. <laughs> yep. Yep. So, definitely seen pictures of just like the tree with no uh, close up of the leaf. And yeah, yeah that's almost impossible. And, and if people uh, think they're, you know, halfway decent at identifying, say, either plants or bees or birds or whatever category of organism, um, please feel free with the City Nature Challenge or any other project to uh, chime in and, you know, put in what you think 
that specimen is, because we're going to need people, I think, to identify, help identify that week after, you know, we're going to get barraged with lots of uh, photos of organisms. And um, it would be great if people can, in their leisure, you know, uh, try to identify, go to something that says plant, if you're good at plants, and see if there are any you can chime in on an identification for. I think that would be really helpful. Yes. Um, and as far as, I, I just saw a question from Joni Prentice, do we need to register for the City Nature Challenge? Uh, no, what you need to do is find the project under community in the website version of INAD. I think you go to the menu community and you select projects and, and all of a sudden you'll see a, a load of projects, most of which are near you and look for the one you want to just click on and join in that way any photos you take in that time window in the specified geographic boundary for, you know, for us, for us in Louisville, it's Je Jefferson County. Um, any photos taken in that time window that day will automatically be sent, not just to your life list, but to the project, as long as you have selected the project ahead of time. Yes, so but to specify for the for the city nature challenge projects, you don't have to join those for your observations to count. Um, with the botany blitz one, you do, but the city nature challenge, it is like just an open collection project. So anything that falls within Jefferson County will count towards that project. Anything that falls in a Fayette County will count towards that project and so forth. Yeah, except that by joining the project, you will get the like uh, journal posts by the administrator. Yeah. You know, um, like what I'm yeah. putting there is any any special hikes people are leading in different locations in that time window. So if you join the project, you can see those posts uh, either by going to it directly or by selecting news in the yeah. menu. Yeah, that's very helpful. And then you can also just as when, once the challenge starts, you can find that project more easily. If you join, then you can just go to your project page and then click on it periodically and just to see how the numbers are doing. Um, and we also have an umbrella project for all of the <laughs> Kentucky cities. So I think it's like Kentucky City Nature Challenge 2022 cities. If you search for that in iNaturalist, you'll find the umbrella project and you'll be able, when the, when the challenge starts to see in real time, how those projects are doing against each other. So if, if Jefferson County is just like barely ahead of Fayette County, then we know that we've got to like start getting more people to make <laughs> observations. A friendly rivalry. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, this is being fun. I hope everyone just has a good time. And you can, and by the way, you can take photos, say of plants and sidewalk cracks in the city. Mm -hmm. if that's what, I mean, those count, they're wild. Yep. You know, those, and they are actually useful to urban ecologists, and that is, I am one. So um, knowing what is coming up, even if they're, you know, dandelions in the sidewalk cracks in different places can be used for studies, actually. So don't ignore, it doesn't have to be just in natural areas. Yep. Abandoned lots are good, too. Yep, absolutely. So Beverly, there's a couple of um, questions relating specifically to iNaturalist. Um, Wes, who happened to see some great purple hair streaks or who saw mm -hmm. one in Berea, luckily, um, also asked just now about this duplicating observations. Do you see that question? Should I read this? It's not familiar to me. I will read um, it. I'm, I haven't seen it yet. It's a question about duplicating observations. Would you care to speak on duplicating observations? I've only recently begun using that feature when I have multiple You got birds. frozen on me, Josie. Oh, okay. <laughs> or or Wes, people hear me if okay? you want to ask the question. I can hear you, Josie. Oh, you can. Okay, yeah. well, I'll just uh, turn off my video. Um, so Beverly, can you hear me? Looks like Beverly's the frozen one. Wes, do you want to talk about what you're talking about? <laughs> oh no, sorry. <laughs> Never mind, Wes. Okay. Oh, there's Beverly's back, but she's unmuted. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> froze on my end and I didn't catch everything. So I, I understand it to be a question about duplicating observations. 
Yes, but um, he's used it for when he has multiple birds in one audio recording. So maybe using, hmm. okay. putting it into another, duplicating the audio and, and identifying yeah. the next. So that's actually a feature that I have not used. Um, I noticed it was under the tutorial vo um, videos for how to um, duplicate an observation. I could see that being useful, like if there's some information that you don't want to keep resubmitting, especially if it's like location or you know date and things like and so forth, then you could duplicate those and then swap out the photos and other things. So it could be a useful feature. It's just not one that I have a lot of experience with. Okay. Um, I, did it, I did it with cicadas last year. This is Margaret again. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, if you've got a, a couple of different voices, you know, of whatever, birds or whatever, I would recommend you just put them up as separate, um, you know, the same file, but se separate audios and um, same as pictures, right? You got two species on there. You just put them up separately and then say, I see a, uh, a such and such, or I hear a such and such in this recording. And then for the second time, I hear the other one in this recording. So two separate observations, either mm -hmm. of visuals or of, of um, audios. And people will chime into that. I, I did it last year with the cicadas. I, there were three different species so uh, sometimes. So um, that's what I did. And that's how it was accepted. And I have also used the same picture for two separate observations where one was on a flower and one was on, uh, or one was a flower and one was the pollinator. Mm -hmm. And if you get into the desktop version, you can like also link those observations to each other, but it's a more tedious process that I did not cover tonight. Um, you know, and it, I'm kind of hoping that one day iNaturalist will be able to have a feature where you can identify like multiple species in one observation so that you could kind of maybe more easily see like certain pollinators associated with certain flowers and so forth, but you know, they're obviously not there yet, but that's just a, a dream. There's another question. Uh, sometimes flies look like bees. If you're not sure which one it is, what should you say in the what did you observe section? So um, that happens to me somewhat regularly um, and they are in two different um, families and uh, two different orders even. Um, so that's where I would probably just say, you know, I think you, there's um, one that's like winged insects or winged and once winged insects group. Um, so you could put it in that and somebody will find it and identify it or at least like take it down to a closer level. And somebody has a, another, another similar question, um, sawfly larva and caterpillars. Hmm. <laughs> that can be tricky. I know it's like the number of prolegs uh, that can differentiate the two. Um, and I can't remember off the top of my head what those numbers are. Um, sometimes it just kind of, you know, it, like every now and then I, I definitely have misidentified a sawfly as a caterpillar. Um, and, and that happens. Um, but uh, if, you, if you don't know, then again, you can just put like insect or, um, and that's okay. Alternatively, you can say sawfly. And believe me, the iNaturalist experts will chime in and tell you whether you're right or wrong pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know there's an iNaturalist user um, named Kate the Great, um, and they um, are on there identifying caterpillars pretty regularly. So. Any other questions? Josie, do you see any other questions that? Uh, one just came in. Okay. Uh, let's see, another question. In what concrete ways has iNaturalist helped further the work done at Floracliff or in what ways do you think it might help in the future? Um, well, for us, I mean, there are in some aspects, um, you know, these days we're almost using iNaturalist to keep up with, with um, certain groups. You know, before iNaturalist, a lot of um, natural areas, you know, had species lists for, you know, plants, birds, um, reptiles and amphibians. Um, and then after that, you know, it was like, you're lucky if you get, you know, extensive list for some of the other groups. And so, especially when it comes to like, you know, invertebrates, um, you know, most of our, um, 
our Lepidoptera observations are, are on iNaturalist now. Um, our spider list is probably completely on iNaturalist and, and we can keep up with it more easily there than I can keep up with it like in an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and I can also see like, you know, which ones are more commonly observed at Flora Cliff than others. Um, and it also just makes our, um, you know, our biodiversity and our species list at Flora Cliff more engaging to the public. You know, if I kept it in a private database, then I wouldn't be able to easily share, you know, in this very sort of visual and photographic way, you know, to other people, like, look at all the birds, look at all the butterflies um, that we've observed out here. Um, you know, to just look at a list of names is not nearly as engaging or as interesting. So I think iNaturalist can be really useful um, in that way. So let's see, um, Dan, can you comment on submitting to competing databases? So submitting to eBird versus iNaturalist. So I don't necessarily consider those as um, competing. I see them as um, doing two, providing two different um, services. Uh, so, you know, with eBird or there's also a similar website now called eButterfly. Um, those are um, species counts. Um, so like in the beginning of the, um, uh, the webinar, one thing I said that iNaturalist doesn't do is it doesn't provide data on um, species populations um, and trends of populations. And so eBird, um, because people don't have to photograph, it's all based on um, sort of, you know, observations of a person and they're counting as they're going, you do get more of those population trends um, on um, eBird. Um, but with iNaturalist, you know, it's going to cover all biodiversity. So you kind of get that benefit there and then you can um, and then, you know, biologists um, in the field can have those photographic evidence of, hey, this, this species was documented in this um, a new area that we didn't know about, and they can reach out to that person and find out about it that way. So they're kind of providing, I think, two separate services rather than um, competing with each other. Um, you know, and there are going to be some people that are more into um, the counts and looking at the population trends and some people that are more into the other thing. And Lee has a question on the bottom here. Um, if he were to document a rare or at-risk species and, and didn't realize at the time that it was rare, um, can he change that later to yes. obscure it? Yes, and um, I do think that there may be, um, you know, I think some of the state heritage programs are, you know, working with iNaturalist on what species should be automatically obscured. Um, you know, there may be some plants that are ranked like S2, um, which would maybe not be automatically obscured, um, but you might get like, um, you know, Vanessa or Tara, you know, contacting you and um, asking for more information if it's in a location that they didn't know about. And then, you know, by that way, um, then you might learn that like, oh, I should obscure this and, and so forth. And so any of your observations, you can go back and edit later. Yes, absolutely. And if you, even if you, if you misidentified it when you first posted it and you're like, oh, no, that's not what that is. Now that I know more information, you can go back and you can change your ID. Any other questions? You don't have to ch type them in the chat at this point either. If you have any, um, if you want to turn your mic on, that's okay too. All right. Well, I think we've wrapped up this um, presentation. So I appreciate you all for coming tonight. And we, of course, have recorded it. Uh, we'll send you the recording. You can share it with as many people as you want. Um, we'll, we'll either have the recording available through a Zoom link or we'll transfer it over to Dropbox and send it that way. Um, but we will make sure that you get it. So thank you all. And hopefully we'll see you soon. And maybe we'll see you on uh, one of those um, iNaturalist tutorial walks coming up. Thank you, Beverly and Josie. It's great. All right. Bye, everyone.